this paper <clears throat> is on Dhyana is not mindfulness by Sri Raghu Anantanarayanji, Ankush Vij, and Dr. Nandini Murali. Uh, Dr. Sri Raghuji, yeah. Come on. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Jaraman. Uh, Ankush will be making the presentation on our behalf, and then I'll be there to take the questions. And yes, yeah. Sri Gurubhyo Namaha. At the outset, uh, the authors would like to thank all the organizers for giving us this opportunity to, to present this paper. The subject of our paper is Dhyana is not uh, mindfulness. We are beginning with the gist of our proposition. Dhyana is a process that allows one to move step by step towards something transcendental. Whereas modern mindfulness, as it is being used currently, is like a pill for an ill. Dhyana, according to Yogacharya Krishnamacharya, has two very critical components. Dhyana, described in the second chapter of Yoga Sutra, concerns itself with gaining a deep understanding of where the kleshas are coming from, how to burn the seeds of those kleshas, and then enable the mind to become capable of ekagrata. It is after one has burned the seeds of klesha and become capable of ekagrata, there is another level of dhyana described in the third chapter, which is often confused. Yoga Sutra chapter three defines dhyana as an application of mind into a chosen object of inquiry and finally going into nirbija samadhi. Now we are calling this modern mindfulness as allopathic mindfulness, which seems to be the latest fad in leadership and management. There is a considerable amount of published research, which focuses on how organizational leaders such as CEOs benefit from just 20 minutes of mindfulness practice. And the authors of this paper don't doubt the research done by Joan Kabat-Zinn and others on Buddhist meditators. However, as, uh, as practitioners of Dhyana, we are concerned by the way ideas from Yoga Sutra or Yoga Shastra have been uprooted from an Indic context and almost force fitted into Western frameworks. First, there is the presentation of mindfulness as if it is the active ingredient of Ashtanga Yoga. This is reminiscent of the way from pharmaceutical companies study many traditional healing practices and herbs to extract that one chemical that is the essential curative element. This chemical is then patented, synthesized in a factory, and the promising future then belongs to the company's top line. But dhyana is not a detachable fragment. It has been recognized that when the active agents are separated from the holistic herbal preparations, there are side effects, which are otherwise, which otherwise the whole herb does not create. Often the herb is part of a dietary regimen and an integral part of the holistic treatment. One wonders what the side effects would be from practicing or rather swallowing the mindfulness pill. Second, this, this idea that human being is an integral part of nature is central to the way of life from which these contemplative practices have emerged. We are sure that, that mindfulness as it is promoted will make many executives more effective, but does it inspire them to ask the difficult questions regarding their motivations, regarding the impact of their business on the environment, on equity? These are some of the questions to be considered. Third, Mindfulness is presented almost as if it is a modern discovery. If one browses Wikipedia, one comes across this line on mindfulness, a famous exercise introduced by Kabat-Zinn in his MBSR program is the mindful tasting of a raisin in which a raisin is being tasted and eaten mindfully. Many such simple practices set in the everyday routine are recommended dharana practices that our teacher Yogacharya Krishnamacharya would mention casually. While the serious researchers may not be part of this cultural appropriation, we nevertheless run the risk of a practice that has profound possibilities of turning into a pill for an ill. Just like much of, much of yoga has been plucked out of its context and distorted beyond recognition in the name of making it accessible or rather more commercially viable. Now currently what is referred to as uh, meditation, especially in the Western discourse, emerges from the work of Dr. Herbert Benson. 
Dr. Herbert Benson is a professor from uh, Harvard Medical School, and he coined the term relaxation response. Dr. Benson based his research on a secular version of transcendental meditation of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. After conducting his initial studies, Dr. Benson concluded, and I quote, ultimately, I felt there were two, two main steps. Step one was a repetition of a word, a sound, or a prayer. And the second step was when any thoughts came to mind, one disregarded them and returned to the repetition. Now, instead of using Sanskrit or other religious terms as is done in transcendental meditation, he had research participants use neutral words like Coca-Cola. Dr. Benson concluded that whether one says Coca-Cola or any other word, it doesn't matter because it creates the same effect. This, however, is a very superficial and a simplistic understanding of a nuanced and a deeply layered process. The critical idea that underpins yoga is the process of creating an and. The, the, current, the current trend, which is largely borrowed from the West, is the idea of or, creating exclusivity. Any process that says or is not yoga. Therefore, the question, what is one yoking with, is central to the practice of yoga. When one starts with Om, it has the power to take one all the way to further and further deeper states. Whereas if one starts with Coca-Cola, it doesn't. Yoga Sutra explicates the meaning of Om as do several Upanishads. One, one can start with the superficial chanting, which is equivalent to Coca-Cola, where just because one is chanting the sound and one is cutting oneself off from other things, there are certain benefits that one will get. While Coca-Cola can take, cannot take one any further, Om has the potential to take one much further. As, as one simultaneously gets drawn into just listening to the inner sound, it gets evoked into deeper and deeper states until one merges with consciousness. Whereas the only uh, association one can have with Coca-Cola is rum, fizz, and hedonistic pleasures. Now, dhyana in the Yoga Sutra is infinitely deeper than the simplistic conclusions drawn by Dr. Benson that have only trivialized and distorted the issue. According to Krishnamacharya, there are three mandatory steps before one really understands or enters the space of dhyana. The first step is through the practice of yama niyama. One cuts off the context which is causing dukkha and hence stressful. The second step is when one really discovers pratyahara, which means there are certain inner urge, there is a certain inner urge towards externality. Therefore, one feels the cycle of going out, getting stressed, and so on. This movement is necessary for livelihood, and so on. This movement, but what we do is we overlay it with all kinds of cravings and compulsions. So pratyahara is the process of pulling back and not feeding this cycle of compulsive consumption. The third step is, now that one has gathered one's pranic energy, one directs it into something inspiring and elevated. This is dharana. Once one has decided where one's attention should be directed, there is nothing more for one to do except to stay with the process. So one cannot do meditation. If one stays with dharana, it automatically deepens into something called dhyana. There's a very clear analogy that describes this process. Dharana is like the process of pouring oil into a cup. The oil is one's pranic energy, and the cup represents the object one is focusing on. During dharana, the oil is being poured drop by drop. The flow is intermittent. Dhyana is when the flow becomes continuous and streamlined. It becomes a dhara. Samadhi is when there's only the flow, there's no sense of the self, there's no sense of the cup. One is completely attuned, and one is with the flow. So the ex explication of the cosmos, which is derived from the Sankhya philosophy must be kept in mind when we engage with Dhyana. In the 35th Sutra of the first chapter, Patanjali defines the process of deep attentiveness. Vishayavativa pravitti rutpanna manasaha sthiti nibandhini. When one starts paying attention to any object, one touches the externalities of the object. 
and then as one keeps paying attention one's mind becomes more subtle and one is able to touch the subtler aspects of the object so the process of dharana dhyana and samadhi must be understood as a melting away of the apparent separation between the dhyayam the object and the dhyata the observer but there are many implications here however the most important aspect is the quality of the object one chooses for dharana it impacts the mind profoundly yoga shastra warns the novice that the object must be chosen with care most people are not aware that these sculptures that are recommended as objects of dhyana are beautified forms of sacred geometry sthapati shri shri ganapati sthapati the iconic vastu shastra exponent describes this in detail in his documentary vastu marabu it is the profound and subtle harmony that underpins the form and imbues the form with power the importance of the subtle stages is is emphasized in the sutra vitarka vichara ananda asmita rupa anugamat sampragnatah complete comprehension follows these four steps argument enquiry joy at the at, at finding the essence of the substance and finally integration with the all it therefore follows that any random object cannot be picked as the object of meditation also if the object does not have the ability to draw the person towards more exalted states it could be detrimental if one takes a word like coca cola it does not intrinsically have the depth or deep meaning it has no kalyana guna in contrast a word like om is pranava swarupa and directs us to ishvara swarupa yoga sutra therefore says om is an object par excellence and if one actually goes into it and starts practicing it is possible to discover deeper and deeper states from which one can listen to the sound engage insightfully with the meanings of the sound this has been discussed at length in many upanishads as the word is so rich with these range of meanings yes it is it will be worthwhile to examine a few more critical ideas from patanjali yoga sutra to contrast the seriousness of the practice of dhyana and the superficiality of the idea of meditation and mindfulness as it is commonly understood dhyana heyah tad vrittayah dhyana is the process through which movement unfolding and flow that is based on klesha vritti can be stopped the unfolding of the seeds of avidya or apprehension misapprehension can be stopped when starts focusing on the way in which avidya arises in one psyche and this focusing helps to end the klesha vritti dhyana has a certain energy and if it is focused on the seeds they will be burnt and the obstacles within removed tat pratishedhartham ek tatva abhyasa this is one way recommended in yoga tat pratishedhartham means to end something to make it smaller and smaller one cannot take up any practice and call it ek tatva abhyasa Sri Krishna Macharya has said that Eka Tattva means Ishvara Bhakti. Whatever practice one takes up, one has to keep clarifying the mind, practicing consistently until all the hindrances are confronted and ended. One then earns Purusha Khyati, or an insight into the true nature of Purusha, something that is indicated by Pranava or Omkar. Yatha Abhimata Dhyana Adva. abhimatam is is that which is inspiring elevating and personally evocative one follows a path that will take one towards ek tattva the ultimate consciousness so one practices dhyanam which deeply resonates with the self and one has to make a choice of the right object one that will awaken the divine spark within so uh, towards the end uh, as we summarize Uh, we are looking at one at one end of the spectrum modern meditation or mindfulness how it is looked at to the sense of instrumentality and stress reduction there is also the other end where it becomes an escape from problems in the pursuit of supreme bliss the krishna macharya tradition talks about this whole movement from the superficial to the profound as well as defining practices to enable this movement hence this process is of vital importance 
not getting caught with either of these two extremes. Until one works with oneself and the kleshas in one's psyche, there is no real understanding. There is no real meaning of paramatma. It is just a word with its fantasies and associations. A mere cutting off of the external stimuli and creating a bubble and isolating oneself from a disturbing stimuli it is only a preliminary step. If this does not seamlessly move into an inward turning and grounding in a deeper inquiry of the self, with the possibility of discovering the transcendent self, this practice cannot be termed jnana. With this, I'd like to stop. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ankoshji. Um, so there is uh, an observation and also a question from uh, uh, Shri Megji, who is a director for special projects at Indica. Shri Megji, please uh, go on. Questions. Dr. Jeraman? Yes. Kekalapa, our Pesra Rana. Ah, he is uh, he has unmuted, but uh, I can also not hear. Megji, can you? Yeah, we cannot hear you. Can you type out the question and then you can read it out or something? I'll just see. Megji, can you hear? Please oh. proceed, no Yeah, 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 yeah. I will take it offline. Sorry. Okay, right. Um, so there is another question from Dr. Uh, Arun Pratap, very important uh, points raised, uh, Ankosh Ji. How can we exactly differentiate between mindfulness and dhyana? This is the question. I thought, I thought the whole paper was <laughs> based on this. Uh, see, to put it simply, na, mindfulness is very clearly uh, an extraction from the whole idea of dhyana. See, if you go into John Kabat-Zinn and what he has done, he, it's has, practiced, he has practiced uh, Vipassana meditation quite a bit. His first couple of books were on Vipassana. And then he himself talks about having this great idea that we have to present it in a very simple way to the West. And we all know the context in the West. The context in the West is to say that unless it is presented to me in my terms and something useful for me, I'm going to reject it. So this whole uh, cosmos of how to look at oneself, how to look at the world, how to look at one's context, the primary purpose of getting into dhyana and meditative practices, all of this is set aside and you take one small bit of it which is some practices, yeah, like chanting Coca-Cola or chanting one, which is what Dr. Benson starts with, or saying pay attention when you're walking and things like that, that uh, other people have also talked about quite a bit. Thikna Thaan has talked about it, but they use it as a very simple initial step to go much further in. So if you look at Thikna Thaan, who I think is the first person to use the term mindfulness, he takes it into very deep contemplative things. He also talks about the Brahma Vihara. He takes it into the life of Buddha. Right. So Dhyana, which is to have a relationship with a, with a much more deep object and a much more deep process, gets forgotten when you look at it as mindfulness. That's the fundamental thing we're talking about. And Krishnamacharya has talked about a whole set of practices as Antaranga Yoga, which takes you from the Bahiranga to Parama Antaranga. These become extremely critical because these are psychologically transformative processes. That's the difference that we have to keep in mind. 
Thank you, sir. There is also further uh, follow-up question. I think uh, Arun Pratap ji, you can uh, uh, take it up uh, offline with uh, 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 Raghu ji. Uh, thank you very Chairman much. ji, by any chance, am I audible now? Oh, yes, 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 ji. Please. Okay. I apologize. If if it's okay to take a minute, I'd just like to take it. Yes, please. Uh, ji. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please, so, please. Uh, wonderful presentation. I love the slide nine. And the fundamental premise of not reducing dhyana to mindfulness, whatever be the definition of mindfulness, which there are many now, uh, is something that resonates. But I had one observation, uh, because leadership and management as domains entirely were uh, were invoked, uh, I would like to refer the presenters to Kevin Jackson's review of the mind of a leader, published in the Journal of Business Ethics, Volume 159, pages 927 to 934. It contains some of the critiques that I heard the presenter present of uh, some of the points on mindfulness of a specific school of mindfulness. That's one. My question is, is uh, your, your title is provocatively, if I could call it so, uh, presented. Is it uh, is it also targeted at a particular school of thought or a set of scholars who have claimed dhyana to be mindfulness, or is it more a broad, uh, broad necess a broad critique? It's more a broad critique, Megji, because the current trend is following a very colonial mindset. No, so you go into a space you take what you want and then you demonize that space. Yeah, now if you look at what's happened to Africa, I don't think very many people know what a phenomenal con uh, civilization Benin was, for example, or what a great center of learning Timbuktu was. We right. don't say, you know, are you going to Timbuktu just for fun? Because Timbuktu was known as a place where people would carry books on their head and sell it on the roads. Now. Generally, Africa is presented to you as the darkest continent, right? not as a continent with great learning, right? So right. whatever needed to be extracted have been extracted, and now you call it a darkest this thing, and then you take people for slaves, and you have built a whole economy in the US based on slaves, right? What's happening now with many practices being taken from colonized countries, not just yoga, is of the same variety. Yeah, got it. So I think there needs to be a clear statement, right, which opposes this mind, and this is not just a Western mind, Megji. Right, right. Yeah, most Indians would rather learn mindfulness than learn dhyana, without understanding what kind of a thing they are promoting. Correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So great. Uh, that's thank you for clarifying. So it's not targeted at a, a scholar or set of scholars, but more a broad trend based critique that uh, that you have presented, which which totally makes sense to me. And yeah, it makes no sense to reduce all of dhyana to mindfulness, even if some forms of mindfulness might have certain ingredients which are common, like a subset of the whole stream that Dhyana is. Thank you so much. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. I haven't come across a single statement on mindfulness that talks about the importance of Yama and Niyama. Yes. I haven't talk, seen a single one that talks about the ethics concerning nature. Nothing. I've not heard any mindfulness thing being placed in the context of what the human being is doing, what is Dharma and so on. So if you take something from a dharmic civilization and cut out the context completely and present it in a context where the fundamental paradigm is utilitarianism, I think it has to be called out. Absolutely. That's why Kevin Jackson's uh, review would also resonate with you. Thank you for the opportunity to ask the question. Yeah. Just, just type out the details, Megji. I'll send it to you. Okay. Nagaraji, you would want to make comments? No, uh, the uh, <clears throat> broad critique, uh, as Megji has pointed out, it is uh, abundant uh, already on uh, academia.edu. If you see, there are a very big number of papers that uh, call out 
the secularization claims of uh, <clears throat> the mindfulness campaigners. I, I would call them man, mindfulness marketers. Uh, and uh, the injustice done to uh, traditional Buddhist practices, traditional Buddhist ethics, traditional Buddhist culture uh, through this uh, mindfulness marketing uh, is regularly being called out by a very big number of uh, American, white American scholars themselves. Uh, but the claims on the part of the marketers are in <clears throat> the words of secularization, bringing scientific uh, aspects and all that. But in that name, then all uh, the sacred aspects are, are removed. Uh, what Raguji is saying happens. You remove all the ethical aspects, you re remove all the cultural aspects in that. And uh, in fact, it should fail. If uh, people are still feeling that it is working, it, it should be placebo. Uh, you are also passionate exactly. about that, Nagaraji. How just this uh, abstracted thing is actually not working? There are some papers about that also. Yeah, it should be just placebo. Uh, if it really has to work, it has to be placed in the entire framework of yama, niyama, etc. Everything. Then only it would work. Uh, so these uh, claims of the marketers. Uh, lots of fraud in it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Raghuji. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ankush ji and uh, Dr. Um, um, Nandini ji. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, for this, this was a very pertinent pr presentation relevant to the theme of the conference. Thank you very much. Uh,